Hey everybody, two alpha gals here. I'm Debbie Nichols. And I'm Candace Mathis. And you're listening to In the Tall Grass, where we're sharing stories of reinvention, resilience, and rediscovering joy. Whether it's facing alpha gal syndrome or any other redefining chapter of life, we all have to learn how to navigate the journey through the tall grass. So here we go. Hey, everybody. So today we are super excited for our conversation with one of my dear friends, Ashley Fillmore, who is a personal trainer and nutrition coach. Ashley lives in Florida with her husband and two daughters and has almost 20 years of personal training and nutrition experience. She built an amazing online training business, Metabolic Fix, where she specializes in women's hormonal health and sustainable fitness programs. Ashley is also the host of the Cheers to Your Success podcast, and we cannot wait to dive into this conversation with her. So Ashley, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me on. Hi, Candace. Hi, Debbie. And thank you for such a great introduction. You went over all the important things about me and who I am and what I do. Yeah. Well, we know that this conversation is going to be so valuable for our community. Um, So can you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself? What got you interested in personal training, fitness, nutrition, women's health? I know that's a lot, but we would love to just kind of hear your backstory. Yeah, I would love to share that with you. So I started my career when I was actually in college, it's been the only thing I've done. My internship actually turned into my full-time job, which is where I met you, Candice. I met so many amazing people through working for my old boss and company. It was such an amazing experience for me to start my career. But early in my life, I would say probably when I was a teenager, after my mother passed away, I really started to realize how important it was to be healthy. My mother struggled with health. She struggled with her weight. um, And let's just say resources and knowing how to take care of herself wasn't something that she knew how to do and definitely wasn't the norm within our family. Self-care wasn't really a priority. It was more survival and just trying to make ends meet. So as as I was going through high school and then into college, I thought, you know, I really want to help people. And at that time, I thought, okay, well, I can become a certified health educator, a personal trainer, and focus in on nutrition, which is what I did. And so my undergraduate degree is in exercise and nutrition. I'm also a certified health educator, which is something I don't really add in there often because I do specialize more in personal training and nutrition, specifically in women's health and hormonal health as it pertains to sustainable body transformation. But I knew that, you know, I really wanted to dive in and help people. And instead of being on the treatment side, I wanted to be on the prevention side. And so found an internship, our, you know, messaging and the way that we wanted to help people align. And I thought, this is for me. So I started working and it was amazing. I was working with many amazing women, just like yourself, Candice, and you know, it was such an amazing experience to be on the other side of helping women prevent illness and get healthier and learn how to strength train and learn how to eat correctly. And I realized through this journey that that wasn't something we knew, you know, strength training wasn't a thing in the nineties. Um, fortunately there are certain different methodologies with training, like CrossFit workouts and you know, certain other fitness classes that were coming out, introducing weights where women started to lift weights, but it really wasn't the norm still. So, you know, it's been so great to have that pushed out as the norm with weight training and seeing more women do that. So it was so nice to see women coming in and starting to strength train and focus in on eating enough of the right foods. And so with this amazing experience, we were more on the preventative side of things and just helping women learn how to take care of their bodies through proper exercise for them, proper nutrition. And although that was amazing, I did start to see certain women still struggle throughout. And so that's when I specialized and got some advanced certifications in hormonal health for women, because unfortunately, working out a couple of times a week and eating healthy wasn't enough. And I saw 
a difference between the women that were perimenopause, so in their 40s and going into their 50s, compared to someone that was maybe 20 or even their early 30s. And so I said, we need to do this different differently. So that's when I started looking into hormones. That's when I started becoming educated on that. And that's when I became an expert in understanding women's hormones, but specifically for, you know, getting healthier, losing weight, body composition changes, and some of the natural transitions we experience as women, but we don't have experts there to guide us through the journey. We don't really know what's normal. And when things happen, we just say, huh, this is the way it's supposed to be, or this is the way I should feel at this age. And so with my certifications, we really work around that and find natural, holistic, healthy ways to, you know, help our clients get in a better place, understand what their hormones are, have a better understanding of their body, their metabolism. What does that even mean? Why do you need to strength train? It's almost like strength training in women's health 101, you know, just breaking it all down. And it's been such an amazing journey. I've loved it. I specialize with women. So for years now, I've only been working with women. Most of the women I work with are 35 plus. I would say the majority are in their 40s, even in their 50s. And now that I'm online, I get to help women all around the world, which is just amazing. And as you guys know, too, with your program, it's so great to just be able to reach more people outside of your local community. And so now I do the same thing, but online. And it's just been really great through my company, Metabolic Fix. It sounds like you offer so much, you know, in this breadth of programs that you have developed and and the skills that you have built and honed and really focused on in order to do this where you're focusing on the prevention piece instead of necessarily the treatment piece of this. I loved when you said that, you know, we talk so much about resilience and reinvention, especially when it comes to chronic illness. And what I'm wondering is, you know, were there times in your life that forced you to develop resilience in order to get to this place of being able to address prevention instead of treatment? Yeah. So there's definitely been times in my own journey where I really had to just hone in on that. So although I had a lot of education, formal education, should I say, and then, you know, more certifications, personal training certifications, nutrition certifications, um, I really struggled personally. And so that was a big part of my journey. And I did not come out and speak openly about that because I felt like it would I guess you would say devalue my expertise would be a good way to put it. And so for many years throughout my journey, especially my early 20s, you know, I was really young. Um, I had a lot of self-esteem issues, which maybe people wouldn't realize from the outside. Um, I definitely had a lot of self-worth issues as well. And so much was tied to, tied into this image. And I really felt like, you know, if I didn't look a certain way, I wasn't good enough, or if I couldn't be like X person on the magazine or X person I knew in my town that, you know, I really wasn't checking the boxes. So I worked with a lot of men, which was great and no offense to men, but you know, there is definitely a difference in women and men when it comes to dieting. And so, you know, if my boss was doing a keto diet where we were only eating protein, guess who was doing that? I was. And for my hormones and for my mindset and my mental health as a woman, it just really kind of led me down this really, I would say, dangerous road where I was cutting out all of my carbs. I was eating minimally. I was training hours a day. I was trying to keep up with the boys in that sense. And, you know, I was really just pushing my body and nothing was working to the to the degree that I wanted it to. So I ended up constantly bouncing from diet to diet and from program to program. I mean, anything you can think about, I would take something that, you know, like paleo and turn it into a really restrictive eating plan. I would take one workout and work out multiple times um, a day and seven days a week. And so it became really toxic for me. And also my professional image was wrapped into this. And as I'm going through this, people are complimenting me. I look so great. And, you know, um, my boss was also complimenting me. And I was kind of just 
put on this pedestal almost for maintaining a high level of strength and just kind of grinding it out. Um, we even had this thing called a leaderboard, which Candace, I don't know if you remember that, but yeah. my personality in that board just didn't really sink well because, you know, if I wasn't at the tip top of it, then I wasn't good enough. So those were my issues. By no means am I blaming anyone else for that. You know, I should have just not participated. Now I know, like, I can't do things like that. Or I probably could now because I see my worth outside of silly numbers like that. But let's just say it ended in a really bad place. I ended up with severe adrenal fatigue. I had severe hormonal problems. I lost my cycle. I could not conceive. We wanted to start a family and I could not get pregnant. I was so exhausted. My progesterone, my estrogen were zero. Like I wasn't even on the charts when you looked at my hormones. Um, my hair was falling out. I would literally have to go lay down for hours after my workout sessions. And I just hit that dead end road. And I know a lot of women in your community with the alpha gal syndrome are facing their own journey as well, where, you know, finally things just get bad enough where you can't overlook it anymore. And that was, that was my journey. I mean, it was almost like there were so many moments where I just brushed symptoms under the rug. I didn't acknowledge it. And maybe some of your ladies or your community can resonate with that. And maybe you guys too, or it's like, oh, I feel this way, but it's okay. I'm just tired. I'm just working really hard. Or for some of my clients, you know, I'm a mom at that time. I didn't have children, but it's an easy excuse I could use now for sure. Being a mom of two, but I would just brush things under the rug mm -hmm. and it worked until it didn't. <laughs> and so finally, when my body just hit that breaking point, also, I was really exhausted. I was tired of secretly struggling. I was tired of battling and kind of doing it all alone. And my body just hit a wall. Yeah. I had to stop everything. I had to stop working out multiple days a week. I had to stop dieting. I had to change everything and build everything back up from the ground up. Yeah. So and yes, I had my own story for sure. Well, and Ashley, as you're talking, I'm like, I mean, cause I knew you then yeah. and yeah. To watch you kind of go through your own transformation from that time has been really beautiful and very inspiring to watch because, you know, like you were saying, we all have our journey. And I think especially people dealing with chronic conditions, you know, when you're dealt this almost overnight for a lot of people, you know, when you, you were feeling okay, or maybe your symptoms weren't as severe and then all of a sudden they are, and you have to really fine tune everything, right? It's like overnight, you have to make this shift. How did you do that? What was kind of that first step for you out of that survival, realizing I can't do this anymore? How did you, how did you shift? Did you have like a specific aha moment or mindset moment that you decided to take a step in the, a different direction? Yeah. So I think that moment, it was an aha moment. And I'm trying to think back to that time frame. And I remember I was trying to think how many doctor appointments I went to before I had my aha moment. I think I was maybe on my third or fourth doctor appointment, specifically seeing a doctor for my extreme exhaustion, not having a cycle, just my body felt so ran down. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just felt horrible. And I think after the appointment, it was on the third or fourth go. I just started to break down in my car. I just was so overwhelmed with all of it. And I was just like, I cannot do this anymore. And I think there's a lot of times in our life when we have those moments, right? It can be with many different categories of life. And it's just like, suddenly that last straw is done and it, it breaks the camel's back, you know? I mean, truly. And I remember just crying and I just thought I cannot do this anymore. And I was so terrified though, because, you know, in the environment I worked in, it was very much so praised to diet well, to push really hard. You know, we had a checklist that we would go through, even the trainers, did you eat your protein? Did you do your veggies? And we would talk about it out loud between our peers and one another. Um, the strength was praised. And I don't want to deem strength training as being a bad thing. 
I took it too far by working out multiple times per day and pushing my body to the extreme. There were lots of warning signs I was overdoing it, but I ignored all of them. I ignored all of the subtle whispers my body was saying, hey, you're doing too much. Hey, you need to back off. Again, I was pushing those things under the rug and I just kept moving forward. That was my aha moment because I realized that I could continue going to the doctors, spending all of this money on co-payments and all of these labs that weren't included. Because also, since nothing was showing up, insurance wasn't okay with paying for all of these labs. So I had to pay out of pocket. And I'm like, okay, I'm spending thousands of dollars. I'm going to the doctors. I'm not going to get any different answers unless one, I get a different kind of help. And I knew that I needed to see someone different, but also I knew that I needed to change because there was no way that I was going to get better if I continued to do all of the things that I did. There was also a lot of shame because it was almost like, you know, better, you know, better. Why are you doing this? You know, better. And I wouldn't tell my clients to do that, but I was doing it to myself. And so you know, a part of the aha moment was also letting go of that and realizing that I needed to do what I needed to do to get healthy. And it literally meant starting at zero again and building myself up very, very slowly. I'd love to speak to that for just a second, that that idea of shame, because I think that that speaks very much to the food allergy community, right? Even me, when I, you know, I've been dealing with this for five years and I often say, and this really resonated with me when you said it out loud was, you know, better, right? I I don't necessarily take risks, but even when I'm treating a reaction and I'm thinking, should I use my EpiPen? Should I do it? I don't want to do it. I don't want to go to the hospital. There's that voice in my head that says, you know better. And it is, it's shame. And and we have to find a way to battle that. How did you, how did you overcome those feelings of shame? How did you push through and get to the other side of that? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing is I realize is I'm a human and it's okay to make mistakes. And I'm very open with that now. And I share my journey a lot um, because I want to normalize it. It's okay. Just because you know and have education doesn't mean that you're not going to have your struggles, right? And for many of us, there's a lot of different things tied to it. Regardless of what it is that you're going through, you could have shame or fear, or maybe you're afraid to go to the doctors because you're fearful of what they're going to tell you. What if it's something else? I mean, I know, Candace, I followed a lot of your story and it is scary when you're going into these appointments and you're getting all of these tests ran and scans done and you're thinking, I have no idea at this point until you're diagnosed, you have no idea what's going on. It could be a terminal or potentially terminal illness. I mean, you don't know. All you know is that you feel bad, right? And so for me, you know, it was realizing that it was, it was okay, Um, you know, sure, were there maybe going to be someone in my journey that would make a negative comment or say, oh, wow, you know, I'm shocked that you shared this journey. And now I don't want to work with you. I mean, I had to let go. And honestly, now that I say a lot of this out loud, it just sounds so silly to me um, (laughs) for many different reasons. But a lot of it is shame. I was embarrassed. Um, I was fearful of the unknown. And I think sometimes when you are not feeling well, you know, there was obviously underlying, you know, concerns. Is there something else going on with me? Because I also didn't want to push it off on my exercise and nutrition. And so there was a lot of that too. And I think it was just realizing that I'm a human and I know I want to work with real people. I want to interact with people that yes, are an expert in their field if I need their expertise, but I want to know their journeys. I want to hear their struggles. I want to know what they've been through too, because it allows me to see that they're human. And I think that's one of the things that really hit me, Debbie, was realizing that it's okay to, 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 to fail, to not succeed. It's okay to be human. It's okay to show vulnerability and that in even admit that you're scared So that really did help me. And I was terrified to really speak on that and start sharing my journey. And sure, I did have many clients come around and say, wow, I never knew you were going through that. Mm -hmm. I never knew. Or people would even say, 
you know, I thought you looked a little thin, but I never wanted to say anything because I thought, you know, you had it figured out. But there were times when, you know, clients would come back around and be like, yeah, remember that day I asked you if you were still working out extra times and you were like, well, kind of. Well, the reason I said that was actually because I thought that maybe you were doing too much. You just looked like you were pushing your body too far in a very compassionate way, not in a judgmental way, not in a, hey, you know, you're not a great trainer or I'm not going to invest in your services or I don't want you to be my coach anymore. It was more on a thank you for sh shining the light on this. And, you know, now that I'm thinking back to the times that I worked with you, it all kind of adds up even more now. Yeah, I can kind of attest to that. You yeah. know, you do. You're looking and it's like, well, Ashley's so strong. Like, how could she be unhealthy or be going through a struggle? You know, it is, it's easy to kind of have your own perspective, I guess. I don't know of what someone else is or is not going through. But, you know, when you guys both were just talking about shame, I always say the shame is in the silence. You know, like it's when we're not sharing and building, you know, our community, it's in that silence, I think, where it stays. But when you start to speak, when you start to share your vulnerability, even when it's hard, it's like the most uncomfortable thing to do. But then that's where like the true healing begins, I think, when and then you see like you end up having camaraderie with people because everyone's going through something, you know, like everyone feels alone at times. And so we need that. We need authenticity. And that's one of the things that I've always come back around to your fitness programming because it is the most sustainable, most you know, it is unlike anything I've ever done before. And I've done CrossFit and I've ate, I ate paleo and I did all those, you know, the things that you were supposed to do. <laughs> and I was like, probably super unhealthy then too, even though I was lean, like, I, I don't know. So it's just this like mind. I don't know. I don't know what the right word is. I'm thinking of something that I probably should not say right now, <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> you know, it just, it messes with your head. I think in a lot of ways, especially for women. So, you know, as someone who was an avid and I, Debbie and I both were, and now we're back into our fitness routines now, but when we were super sick, we couldn't work out. We felt terrible. Debbie dealt with joint pain. I dealt with horrible reactions where I would get really dizzy. Like working out was not on the table at all for me overnight, literally overnight. And I remember having to talk myself into walking again, like walking up and down my road. And I know other people with alpha gal or food allergies or chronic conditions have to start over just like we all did in our own ways. How do you encourage other people to take the, like to start over again, to kind of start at that ground zero when it can seem really daunting and overwhelming? Do you have any advice for people wanting to, even if they could do 10 pull-ups with a weighted vest on and literally overnight could not walk to the bathroom by themselves, what would your like advice be for that person kind of starting over again? Yeah, that's a really, really great question because that person, I think we've all been there in our own versions of that person can be very lonely, very scared, and almost like, hey, this is just going to be it for me. I'll, maybe I'll never get back to where I was. Or there could be depression and anxiety and other emotional responses as well. You know, my number one thought that comes to mind is really giving them hope and helping them realize that they can still move forward. And with proper care and attention and a very gradual start, slow and steady, there will definitely be this amazing thing called a domino effect that happens. And suddenly you're going to be able to do one pull up again, going with your example of the person maybe doing 10 pull ups with the vest. And then maybe over time you're going to go to two and maybe you'll get back up to five. And I truly do believe in my heart that with time, time being the number one thing I want to focus on, you can get back to being a very healthy version of yourself. But here's the mistake I think people make specifically as it pertains to nutrition and exercise. It's all or nothing. 
So we need to break free from this all or nothing mindset. It is toxic and it will ruin your progress. And that will literally keep you stuck because here's the thing. It's not realistic to go from starting at zero again and expecting yourself to be the way that you were five years ago, a year ago, before you had the scary diagnosis or the health condition that came up and kind of threw a wrench in your progress. So you have to start slow. And I always say, start with one thing. That would be my piece of advice for your audience and make it so doable that you're thinking as you're setting this goal for yourself, is this it? Is, are you, I think I can do a little more. You want to set a goal for yourself initially where you're saying that to yourself. I think I could do a little bit more. You're telling me to start off with three walks or two walks and to drink, you know, a, two liters of water. Okay. If I really focus on that, I can do this. I'm actually thinking of a specific client right now, and I will definitely try not to get emotional because I've really worked with her very closely now for two years. So she came into my program being a cancer survivor. She actually had two different forms of cancer. She thought she kicked one of them, and then unfortunately it showed back up in her liver. As you guys can imagine and the listeners, her world was rocked. She lost everything, her health, her job, all of it. She was in the bed, only could survive treatments, but she finally came out on the other end and now she's cured, which is an amazing journey and transformation to share. But unfortunately she lost her fitness. She lost her muscle mass. She lost her, lost her appetite, which also meant she lost weight that she did not need to lose. Before she had this diagnosis, she worked out multiple days a week. She strength trained, ate paleo, kind of similar to some of the stuff that you did too over the years, Candace. And so seeing this new version of herself was heartbreaking. So she trusted in me to get her started again. And so when we started, she was in tears. As you could imagine, we probably all would be in tears and almost ashamed of where she was starting, which is heartbreaking to me because I feel like the shame we put on ourselves and the guilt we feel when we go through things that's literally out of our control. Someone with alpha gal syndrome, they you're not asking or doing anything in your life that's giving you this diagnosis or nor is she with her diagnosis. And so, you know, she was, she was, there's so much shame and this is where I am now. And I just hate my body. I hate the way I look. And, you know, I know this is going very deep and emotional, but these are real feelings that you probably feel throughout your journey. You don't recognize who you are when you look in the mirror. And so when we started, she wasn't eating a lot. She wasn't working out. She wasn't walking. I mean, even base level walking. So instead of saying, hey, we're going to start you out. You're going to eat all of these calories that your body's not used to. And you're going to work out three days a week and give them generic cookie cutter advice for an average healthy person. I said, no, we're going to start off with you walking once a week. That's our goal today. And so guess what she did? She walked once a week. And we also set a protein goal because she was very much so under eating. And I knew if we were going to start to build a base level with building more muscle mass, from all of the research I do, the importance of consuming enough protein. And so we slowly bumped up. It went to two walks and then we did three. And then she said, you know, I think I feel good enough to try one workout a week. So we went to one workout. This lady works out in her living room. She has her cats and her couch and all of that. She doesn't have a big house. She has one bench, three sets of dumbbells and one stability ball. And I have been designing programs for her now for two years. And so slowly she ended up getting up to three days a week and walking at least two to three times. She actually lives in the area you guys live in. And as you know, sometimes there's rain and the weather's not great. So she's not always out walking, but she gets in her strength training workouts. She's eating plenty. She's regained her appetite. She's building muscle and she feels great. And she actually regained some of the weight that she needed to gain, but it started with one walk. That's what it started with. And so you have to start really small 
but work with an expert that can already map out your next steps. If you're working with someone that is a professional and also has experience working with clients that have been through illnesses and challenges, any good coach is going to have a plan laid out for you. Yes, you're going to start with this one thing because on a also something on the side that happens is psychologically, when you see yourself do that one thing, guess what starts to come back? your hope. And when you start to see that you can do this again, it's amazing. That has a domino effect. Even subconsciously, you're telling yourself, I can do this. I'm taking care of myself again. And doesn't it feel so amazing for all of us, no matter what our goals are, to feel like we're taking care of ourselves? So that leads to you doing something else. And then that leads to you doing something else. And then that domino effect occurs and you start to regain that hope and confidence needed to build up from there and keep going. Oh, that's so beautiful. I I love to hear that so much. Thank you for sharing the story with us of your client. I imagine you hear stories, you probably see stories of resilience and success all the time based on your approach to how you're you're building your career, how, how you've built your program and your career. And it sounds like your journey of sort of failing forward or build, you know, building resilience, of admitting that you're scared, all these things that you did in your own life, it sounds like it impacted your career in a really positive way that's allowing you to help a lot of people, whether it's taking that initial baby step or building that plan out so that they can see where they're going. Do you find that other people's stories, like the story you just shared with us, do you find that those stories impact you in the same way in your own personal development and your development of the business? Do they, do they have a strong impact on you and the steps that you take next? Yeah, I would say a hundred percent. And so much of the work that I've done, I've really tried to blend my expertise along with my personal journey and experiences. And so all of the programs I have, the way I communicate with clients, the way I try to show up and get my message across in social media, I really try to intertwine all of that, my story, my journey, my expertise, and it impacts me. I mean, my journey has had a big impact on me. You know, I never, every single person that I speak to that comes into my, into my world, I know their name, I look at them as a person. I read all of their all of their questionnaires. Like I just wrapped up an eight week group coaching program, and every single person that came through, I literally read every word that they wrote, everything that they wanted to accomplish. Because in my opinion, this is another person in the world that's trusting me, that's choosing me to guide them. And so, yes, it's had a huge impact on my me personally as a human. And also with the way I run my company and just the way that I want people to feel when they come into my world, because I want people to understand that they're safe. And I think we get afraid sometimes when there are these more generic, you just kind of have to jump in and go at the flow of everyone else. You know, let's say you're starting a new program or you're interested in something, or maybe even there's a local gym that has a lot of different classes for you. And you think, oh gosh, well, I haven't worked out in years or I've been through all of these things or as Candace mentioned, I'm dizzy when I work out. The last thing you want to do is get in a class of 30 people and get dizzy and feel like you're going to pass out. And so naturally you're going to not do it. You're going to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I wouldn't do that. I would say, nope, not going to that class or any (laughs) class. And so I think having a more customized approach and saying, hey, we will start you where it makes sense and we will build you up slowly so you can build your confidence as well, but and, and you can see what's possible, but we're going to be very smart and strategic about this versus just throwing you in because back to the all or nothing, if you push it too far, too fast, that will generally lead to failure or you feeling discouraged overdoing it. And then that's going to lead to you maybe giving up, maybe saying, this isn't the best for me. I shouldn't be doing this. And so we don't want that. And so I really try and help people break free from the all or nothing mindset and find more balance, which is what I've implemented in my own life as well. You know, now as a mother of two, I have a five and an eight year old. I'm running my business and managing a household. You know, it could never look like it did when I was 20. But here's the beauty is that it doesn't have to. 
even with my client example, I just shared three workouts a week and a couple of walks when she can get them in has done wonders for her health and her quality of life. And I think sometimes we can, as a culture, we can view that as being too little. Really? That's enough? You know, just doing a couple at-home workouts and eating more protein and trying to balance my diet, that's enough? And there's, you know, it's normal to feel kind of skeptical of that when you see all of these programs out there in my community pushing more extreme things and harder workouts and you know, running your body into the ground and the no days off approach. And so it can be hard to believe it almost seems counterintuitive. Yeah. And I like, I think that's one of the things that I appreciate so much about what you're doing and what you're teaching women, especially because we are such complex beings and we've seen it in our own journey of what anaphylaxis has done to our hormone health, to our thyroid at least to mine, you know, I, that it really set off this cascade effect that was really hard to decipher, like what was coming first with it. And I love that you're kind of breaking apart the myths of needing to be overstressed, overworked, you know, all of these things that we've been taught for so long that are actually harming us and not helping us reach these goals. Um, can you kind of break apart, give us like a little snapshot about metabolic fix and your various phases? Like, I love that you have it broken down in the repair, rebuild results phase. Can you just give us like a little snapshot about each one of those phases? Yeah. So through my experience, I learned very quickly. And I think I mentioned this at first that not every woman's in the same spot. Actually, none of us are even really cool. The three of us, we're totally different beings. Our hormonal profiles are different. We probably have a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences. And those differences are significant when it comes to how we should approach things. You know, my goal as a business owner is to see every client. I actually don't have a desire to work with thousands of women in a program. I don't want that actually, which may also seem counterintuitive being a business owner. Sometimes you would think you you want more and more, but I don't. I enjoy being a small business owner. I enjoy working intimately with my clients. I enjoy knowing their names and their stories. With that being said, I enjoy it so much and I want to keep things so tailored to the individual. So early in my career, I learned that we weren't all in the same space, in the same spot, space on a hormonal or metabolic level. And when we would try to do the same thing with all women, put them on the same programs, give them the same nutrition principles. Certain women responded great and others did not. Both were compliant. And so when we looked at the data, it's like, well, both groups are compliant, but this group over here is not responding. You know, she's regressing possibly or not or plateauing. And maybe this other group is thriving and doing better. So I was able to see very early, it's probably about five years into my career, that we needed to be able to customize things. Well, over the years, I started to see how much of an impact your dieting history, your health conditions, your hormonal health, your the frequency that you've strength trained. Are you a beginner, advanced, intermediate? So many factors, your lifestyle, your goals, all impacted what you needed to do. So with a lot of years, it took me over a decade, guys, to even come up with this. I realized, okay, there really are three phases of transformation. And people have consistently from day one fallen into one of the three categories. So the repair phase is phase one, and this is the metabolic fix framework. And the repair phase is for that client that has some form of metabolic damage, which means maybe they have a dieting history, maybe they have health concerns or health conditions that's caused them to chronically undereat. So on a base level, every single one of us needs a certain amount of calories to thrive and survive. If you are not consuming enough calories, just breaking this down very simple, I don't want to take too much of your time on this topic, your metabolism can start to downregulate. So things start to slow down. You conserve energy, which which also means you may gain weight. You may not lose weight. You're you're tired more. Things become a little more sluggish. Maybe as a woman, you notice some extra inches on your midsection and you don't feel great. So that checks off the box of metabolic damage. 
or you have underlying hormonal concerns. These could be known and diagnosed, so thyroid conditions, um, diabetes, there's many different metabolic conditions, but also it could be perimenopause, which is something most women start going through in their early 40s. And so if you check those boxes and you're a beginner with strength training, you would start off in the repair phase. Well, there's another group of women that come in that really don't have a dieting history, that haven't been under eating, that have been strength training, that haven't, you know, really dealt with any chronic health conditions or anything that's really stalled their progress. They just need that solid foundation, great principles, customized nutrition, and a wonderful science-based program. They start off in the rebuild phase, which is my second phase. And then the final phase is where a lot of women want to start, which is the results phase. And this is where you work through your own transformation. I don't want to say the results phase is just a weight loss phase because some women in my community don't want to lose weight. They want to get healthy. They want to feel good again. They want to learn how to eat. They want to learn how to strength train. They want to age better. They want to build muscle mass. And so in the results phase, that's where that happens. But to be in that phase, metabolically speaking, you need to be healthy. Hormonally, you need to be in a good place. You need to have a solid foundation built. And we still shouldn't be doing the basics with proper nutrition. So you should really know how to eat and you should have that guidance and everything's great there. That's the results phase. And then the final part of this is just being in maintenance, which means you're happy with your body. You feel good you're still doing maintenance level of exercise and nutrition, but you're not in that more focused period where you're working towards a goal. And so those are the three phases of transformation. We go through assessments, we ask questions, you fill out paperwork, take quizzes. There's a lot of detailed information that we do on the back end to ensure that you're being put in the correct phase. And then that's where we start you and we build you up from there. So the nutrition side of this, you know, for those of us in the alpha gal community, that is a huge, huge piece. And have you worked with people with alpha gal syndrome and can you kind of guide them? Cause I know it's a little different, especially, you know, Debbie and I had to learn how to navigate this ourselves with eating plant-based and getting enough protein, having our macros kind of in better alignment. So is that something that you're able to help people in our community with as well? Yes. And so since everything is so customized, I can definitely help people work around any type of food allergy. Here's the thing that I advise. If you are dealing with a food allergy or there is a health condition that you are struggling through I highly recommend that you hire a professional when it comes to your nutrition, because unless you have proper training yourself, it may be very, very difficult for you to figure out how to eat enough and what is enough for you. We were just talking offline, Candace, and I even mentioned with you that the standard amount of protein that we would typically prescribe for a woman of your fitness level, your age, we actually had to adjust that because of the alpha gal syndrome. And so just being aware of you, we have many women in the community that have various health conditions, various concerns and allergies. I feel like there's definitely women that deal with some of the symptoms that they, you would experience with alpha gal, but oftentimes when they go to their doctors, it's being brushed under the rug. It's being ignored. Oh, you just need to remove gluten or try dairy free. And it's just these you know, it's like, are you even hearing me type of thing? Like I've already tried this and I don't feel well. I highly recommend that you work with a nutritionist, someone that is specialized in helping women build custom nutrition plans. So you can figure out how to balance things out because with alpha gal, which I know you guys are experts with this, it is tricky because you can eat meat, which is a primary source of protein. You can't have dairy, which is another primary source of protein for vegans or vegetarians, should I say, not a vegan because you're not having either. And so for you, you probably are eating more vegan, but then you have to be careful to not go down the processed vegan tunnel of all of the products that you see. And I have many women in my program that are vegan 
And so they will show me foods that they're eating. And I'm thinking, no, this isn't good. You know, so we need to come up with a plan B, which can be very overwhelming for them because they already feel so restricted. And so then you're telling me I can't go eat this boxed, whatever it may be. And so you have to come up with a plan B, which is why you ladies are amazing because you can help people learn how to eat healthy and do this in a healthy way to support their body. But having that expert guidance the one thing that I will say, being in this industry for so long and also networking and being friends with several people that own similar businesses to mine, cookie cutter programs that do not offer customization would not be a great fit for someone with alpha-gal syndrome or someone that has a chronic health condition or health concern. Because you got to keep in mind the advice you're going to get is going to be so generic. And most of the time, when you go to some of these really big companies, you know, maybe you think that it's a reputable company because they have a lot of followers, or maybe, you know, it's a very trendy diet that everyone's done. But you have to understand a lot of those programs are taking away the customization. And very rarely are you interacting with the creator and or leader of the business or program. It's going to typically be coaches or people that they've hired to help, which really does take away that custom feel that you would get, you know, so I highly recommend customized nutrition support guidance there so you can build a plan that is sustainable and doable for you. Otherwise, you're going to fall into more of the example I just gave where you're going to feel overwhelmed. You're going to feel confused. You're going to see these meal plans. And you're going to be like, I can eat none of these things. And you're going to potentially even see macros, which are how your protein, fats, and carbs, but how many calories you consume are broken into protein, fats, and carbs. You're going to see these unrealistic goals where your protein should be X amount of grams. And you're thinking, I don't eat meat. I don't eat dairy. How am I going to do this? And so having that tailored approach where you can build a blueprint custom to you is really going to be the solution. That's so hopeful, I think, you know, hearing you talk about these options that people have in building a customized fitness plan, a customized nutrition plan. And it sounds like, the, you know, a huge key to this is working with someone who knows what they're doing to make sure that you're doing it in a healthy way. I think another piece of this journey really is has got to be the mental health piece of this. And I'm, I'm curious because I do love the language that I keep hearing you use words like transformation and being healthy rather than dieting or losing weight. Have you had to work on your own mental health to get to such a balanced and healthy and hopeful space? Oh, definitely. I have spent thousands of dollars and years of time working on my mental health and personal development um, it's a big part of what I do. And I feel like it's really a, not only a big part of what I do professionally, but personally, um, you know, a lot of me, a lot of who I am as a person is poured into the work that I do. And so I work a lot and I actually help clients a lot with their mindset. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of shame, low confidence, uh, feeling like a failure, like they're never going to feel better. And so I really try and give women hope and encouragement and I really always like to think more long game because most of us here in this space of life, if you're in your 30s, 40s, or even beyond that, it's sustainability, it's longevity. You know, you want to feel good, not just for today, not just for a vacation, not just for the class reunion. You want to feel good every day. You want to make your days on this planet count. You don't want to walk around and feel bad. And so it really isn't a diet, right? It's a lifestyle. It's embodying this version and becoming this version of yourself that is healthier. It's not just the scale. It's not just a measurement on your body. And for me personally, and with my clients that's had the best transformations, when we think that way, that's when the magic happens. And so it really does become worth it, investing in expert help, having guidance, having support, doing the little things, taking the time and energy to get healthier again. It really becomes worth it because you realize it's not just for today, it's for tomorrow. And there's so many things that we can't control with life. But the one thing that we can control is how we treat our bodies on a day-to-day -day basis. And I find that very empowering to be able to say, yes, there's an 
there's an uncertainty of things I can't predict or control, which can be scary in itself, but what can I do today to take care of myself? And that's what I try and have my clients think as well as what can we do today? Think about transformation, long-term success, investing in your health 401k, you know, for your body, you know, and you're going to see that return, the healthier you eat, the healthier you are with exercise, your mental health is a big part of this. You're going to reap those benefits long-term. I love that so much. I mean, it is, it's, it's just showing the whole person, right? Like that you can't neglect one piece. It has to be a holistic approach. And that's one reason we wanted to bring you on here to share with our community, because your approach is so inspiring. It's so healthy, really, and holistic, truly. So for those that are listening, Ashley, that might want to learn more about your programs, Metabolic Fix, where can they find you? Yeah, so I'm always hanging out on Instagram. That's my preferred platform. And my handle is Ashley underscore Fillmore, F-I-L-L-M-O-R-E-1. You can find me there. That's where I'm sharing lots of nutrition tips, hormones, metabolism, movement, mindset, you know, really trying to give women hope and educate at the same time. I'm also, you can also find me on my podcast. I'm a big podcaster, which you guys are going to be on. I can't wait. Um, And that's cheers to your success. And then my website, Metabolic Fix, is where I break down a lot of the different programs that I have from one-to-one coaching to my workout membership program and some other things that I have going on throughout the year. Awesome. And we'll put all of that in the show notes so everyone can easily access, you know, where you're, where you're at. So Debbie, do you want to ask the last question? Yes. Our favorite question. And we always say we hear it's the hardest, but I'm curious, is there a song, either a song or an artist, an album, any of that, that brings you joy? It can be in this moment. It can be here for all time. But, you know, music is something that brings us so much joy. And so we'd love to hear if there's a song or, or something that brings our guests joy as well. So I have to think about this because there's a lot of songs that bring me joy. It all kind of depends on my mood in the moment and like what's going on. Let me think about this. I know oh. we didn't give you any any prep on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's see here. I'm trying to think who is one of my all time favorites I would say honestly if I'm really wanting to feel just inspired by a beautiful voice which um, it's interesting that she does come to top of mind for me I would say just truly some of Whitney Houston's music year from years ago I mean I could never hit her pitches and I sound horrible when I try and sing along but I just find her music to be so beautiful and just like when the songs come on, everyone in the car gets quiet type of thing. Actually, one just came on on on. We were listening to the radio and an old song and my an older song of hers came on. My daughter said, Mom, what's this? Who's this lady? Her voice is so beautiful. And so I would say that, um, you know, I'm in the phase of life right now with two little girls. And so on a day to day basis, I would say what's bringing us joy right now is the clean version of Taylor Swift. She is kind of blasting through the car, through the music everywhere. And I think that has a lot to do with um, the phase of life I'm in and having two little girls. And so on that note, sometimes we are listening to her, but I would say for me, something like that, cause it just is really just speaks to my heart, what she's talking about typically. And her voice is amazing. I love to hear both sides of that too, because looking back and thinking about when my kids were that age, there were definitely songs or genres or artists that were, you know, played on repeat all the time. And I remember being in that era being like, okay, I guess we're listening to, I don't know, the Black Eyed Peas again, you know, and, and, but now when I hear it, it brings me so much joy because it sends me back to those times where we were in the car and listening to the song again, but I was with my kids and we were singing along. And so I love to hear the different perspectives from 
from both. And I just want to thank you so much, Ashley, for being with us today, for spending time with us, for sharing all this information, which is going to help our community. And, and just, it's been great getting to know you a little bit. So thank you so much for being here with us today. It was so much fun. Thank you guys so much for having me on your show. Oh, thanks friend. And until next time. Thank you for joining us today on In the Tall Grass. Visit us at twoalphagals.com. That's T-W-O alphagals.com. Or you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Two Alpha Gals. If you enjoyed listening, please leave a review and help us grow this community. We're all faced with obstacles on our journey, whether it be food allergies or tick-borne diseases. You might outgrow the reactions, but you won't outgrow the person you become. Ticks suck, but life doesn't have to.